So yes, my name is uh, Greg Root, and uh, I work as an environmental analyst. My, my training is in geology and uh, geophysics. And let me see, we'll just we'll go on to the next one, I guess, here. So I uh, took kind of a twisted path to get to my field, probably like a lot of you all, trying to do a little self uh, uh, exploration and figure out what was important to me. <clears throat> so what happened to me was I entered college as an industrial uh, engineering student. I decided that wasn't really right for me. I tried psychology. I tried journalism. I went to uh, 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 being at a liberal arts school, I had to fulfill a lot of requirements. So I had to do a social science and a physical science and math and stuff like that. Well, I, I took this one class called uh, uh, Historical Geology. It was Geology 101 or 102. And those, these uh, courses have uh, the nickname of uh, Rocks for Jocks because they're typically uh, um, for uh, fulfill, an easy fulfillment of a uh, natural science requirement. But we went on these really cool field trips. I had never been to the White Mountains before because I, I grew up in New York. And so I saw these beautiful mountains. And uh, uh, I thought, if this is what geologists do, then this is the field for me because it's, a, it's amazing. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was out investigating hazardous waste sites. So it wasn't quite what I imagined. but. So I studied geology in college. Then my master's, I went to uh, um, the University of Memphis, where I studied earthquake seismology, and I got a degree in uh, geophysics. So the reason why I did that was because I was sort of on this STEM pathway. I wanted to do something that was quantitative, that was scientific. Uh, geologists, it seemed to me, did a lot of qualitative things. They would describe rock formations. They would, they would assess whether this rock fit into this category or that category. And I wanted to do something a little more, um, a little more quantitative, a little more mathematical. So uh, earthquake seismology was, was something that allowed me to learn more about math and, uh, and that still have that connection to the geosciences. Oh, and also, so, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about my, my background. Um, <clears throat> I do have another degree. It's a PhD from the Survivor TV show. Now, what that means is that I consider myself kind of a nerdy person. And I think that people are probably my weakest point. So I've learned more about people and how to interact with people from that TV show than I think in all of my other endeavors. So, um, so I, if you're like me, if you're that kind of person that sometimes feels a little out of step, uh, you might have to look for uh, opportunities to, to learn about, about people, because that's not something that comes easily to me. But, I also have, uh, once I started on this pathway of being outdoors, learning that I might be able to uh, pursue a career in something that was related to the outdoors, I started to find more and more ways to be outdoors. So I, I uh, hiked the Appalachian Trail. I through hiked it from Georgia to Maine. And you did too? Wow, awesome. That's uncommon to find another through hiker. Um, and then uh, a few years later, uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife who I met on the Appalachian Trail actually, uh, we rode our bikes cross country from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon. And so it, it sound, that was the plan. We actually ended at Newport, Oregon, which is on the coast, and Portland's uh, a little bit uh, inland. And my old uh, roommate said, we stayed with him in Newport, and he said, you know, you don't have to ride to uh, Portland because you've already made it to the coast. I'll drive you, and we can stay here and surf. And I said, OK, all right, we'll do that. So I've done a lot of outdoor stuff. But when I actually got my career going, I started working for MassDEP, Department of Environmental Protection, 
in Boston as a database manager and it was not at all related to my training, my, my schooling, but through my training I had uh, spent a lot of time doing um, computer science related work, doing uh, data signal processing, writing uh, seismic ray tracing programs, and <clears throat> so I guess the point of this is that a lot of times in STEM fields there are things that are directly related to what you've been trained for, but there may, be, there may need to be other ways to break into that field through other ancillary things that you've picked up along the way. So I have a, uh, from that time, which was quite a while ago, um, from that time I, I did some uh, programming and I, I have a 19 year old son who is a computer science major and he thinks, he makes fun of me all the time because I tell him that I have experience as a programmer and he says, well, what language? And I, I say, well, Fortran. He's like, Fortran, is that even a language? That's, you know, th that's not anything. But, so it's, that's just the, the age gap. But, um, so from that point, I did some uh, consulting work as a project manager and a, uh, a field geologist, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And then after I left that, I came back to work for MassDEP and I've worked in the fields of hazardous waste cleanup and now I work with uh, the, in the program of solid waste management. Okay. So talking about STEM as it relates to uh, either the environmental field or geosciences, it's, it's almost unlimited what that can possibly mean for, for a person who wants to get into it. Um, oh, sorry, for, I forgot I had this slide. Does, does anybody get this? If you get it, raise your hand. All right, all right, so. It's actually binary, one, zero, two kinds of people in the world. And so, so that's, that's the kind of thing that with STEM, you know, you're going to be approaching things from a different viewpoint and, and uh, everything is analytical. And if you enjoy that analytical side of it, then, then it's just a question of how, it, how you can plug into it. Okay, so, for example, has anybody ever been to Colorado here? Hmm. So this is uh, uh, in a place called Summit County, Colorado. It's pretty much in the center of the state. Uh, it's near the towns of uh, Breckenridge and Silverthorne. And the interesting thing about this area is that generally it only has about 30 days of the year where the temperature stays above freezing. It goes below freezing a lot of the year. And these are 14,000 foot mountains right here. It, uh, sorry, I, this looked a lot clearer when I put it on the slide. So this is the mine operation here. Uh, does anybody know what molybdenum is used for? It basically is uh, used to alloy with steel to increase its strength. So if you go to buy a bicycle, for example, it may say on the side chrome molly because they've added chrome and molybdenum to the steel and it vastly increases its strength and makes it less brittle. So there's this huge mine um, on the back side of uh, one of these mountains. Pretty much on the other side is a ski area and usually you don't see you don't see that, uh, the mine from the ski side. But the question is, so what happens to the uh, mine operations? What, what do you do? You generate a lot of what are called mine tailings. So um, there's, this is sort of a, um, one of the new aspects of mining that is related to the industrialization of mining. In the old days, you would, you would bore a hole to follow a, a vein of something that you wanted into the mountain. Um, and so you would be, maybe it was gold, maybe it was silver, maybe it was coal. 
and you would pull out that stuff that you wanted and you would have a little bit of uh, rock material that was not that was waste it wasn't uh, what you wanted but in modern times pretty much you find an area that has the ore that you want and it's called molybdenite and you just um, drill and blast and and um, and cart away large amounts of the rock then you pulverize it and you get the ore out that you want and so there's a lot of waste so what happens then is that that waste rock has to go somewhere and a lot of over the past 40 50 years if you go to see a mine operation you'll see vast uh, piles of these tailings and the reason why we're talking about it is because when you take that rock that was bedrock and then you pulverize it into small pieces so that you can get the ore out it creates a whole lot more surface area for um, for rain and snow to contact the rock and so uh, one of the environmental challenges that that uh, is caused by mining is you have this thing this uh, phenomenon called acid mine drainage uh, oftentimes this acidic water is generated when when uh, rainwater snow melt goes through those tailings and then what what happens next is they end up in uh, surface water bodies in creeks and and rivers and lakes and so so then us uh, geologists and other people will work on trying to figure out how to, how to uh, mitigate the impacts of those. Uh, this is, uh, as it says in Australia, this is called super pit. And so this uh, pit is, I believe, three kilometers long and over a kilometer wide, and it goes down um, over 500 meters. And the interesting thing about this, I was, when they blast out the, the uh, ore containing the gold, it looks like there's gold all over the place, right? Well, they use a Caterpillar 793 truck, and it hauls 225 tons of rock per load. I, I, if you think about what a ton is, that's a lot of material. 225 tons. The, the grade of the ore that contains the gold uh, is just over two grams of gold per ton. And so um, each truck carries approximately 450 to 500 grams of gold in it. And if it were all in one lump, it would be about the size of a, a, a golf ball. And so this is the kind of mining that's going on today, is that you, you, you blast and you excavate um, vast quantities of material and then you don't have a whole bunch of people panning through it like in the old days they they take that pulverized rock and they they mix it with a solution of sodium cyanide which then um, the gold uh, forms a, um, uh, a precipitate and you can get the gold out of the solution um, and leave the the uh, rock material behind so so there are um, many environmental challenges in dealing with the, uh, the, <coughs> the mine tailings, um, the processes that, that where you have to use the um, chemical solution to, uh, to remove the gold from the rock. And this is all in the arena of either the, the chemists or the geologists or the engineers. And so, so uh, there are many different um, careers that relate to the geoscience uh, aspect of STEM. This is what acid mine drainage looks like, and this is a particularly bad example in Canada. Um, you can see that this discoloration, actually, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not quite sure, but I believe this is another tributary flowing in here, and you can see it doesn't have that, it doesn't have that orange color in it and this is what flows out of the the tailings 
And so one of the things that relates to my work is having to pick up other types of um, sciences that I wasn't necessarily trained in. Um, I, of course, I was trained as a geologist, but what's happening here is a complex series of about eight reactions. And uh, from the, the tailings, the, the, prime, uh, the prime instigator in creating this is pyrite. So pyrite is made of uh, basically iron sulfide. And it's an amazing problem because the iron sulfide creates one of the strongest acids found in nature. It turns, um, it turns into, it, well, there are, um, there are inorganic chemical processes and then biological processes where bacteria process some of the products of the earlier reactions creating a, a later reaction and ultimately forming sulfuric acid. So where is this all going? Well, the problem is that then when you create the sulfuric acid <clears throat> in the water running through those mine tailings, it leaches out other metals. The orange is usually, what's visible there is iron. Iron is not really that terrible of a contaminant. But there are other metals that aren't really obvious, like arsenic. So uh, one of the main problems that we have with acid mine drainage is that it liberates a lot of uh, the arsenic and then puts it into streams and lakes, and that causes uh, toxicity to, to uh, um, the benthic creatures, whatever is swimming around or in the wetlands of the, uh, of the surface water body. Believe it or not, we actually, I, I actually can't talk about it in detail because it's the subject of a potential enforcement case at DEP. But here in Central Mass, we have an acid mine drainage problem where um, a person took in a lot of rock that was moved from one site to another, and it was all pulverized and crushed. And bad luck for this person because it contained a lot of pyrite. And it was, and it was not something that anybody anticipated, really. But what looked like clean rock fill, there was, there was no um, hazardous waste in it or anything. It's just the minerals that were contained in the, uh, uh, in the, the rock that was uh, crushed and, and stockpiled at the, this location. So that so I've been working on that one case. Uh, I've also I would say my, my bread and butter work right now is working on landfills because the land we have uh, a number of open landfills and uh, many more closed landfills in well most communities, but we have a bunch of them in Central Mass. And so this is what a typical landfill closure looks like. You fill it with all your waste. And then at some point, the, uh, the regulations say it can only get this high. So once you reach that level, you have to stop and you have to close it. And the way to close it is you cover it with a layer of sand so that you can, any gases that are generated inside can migrate through the sand. And you put these um, wells, which are pretty much like PVC pipes, uh, to collect the gas and let it vent out. And then you cover that with regular soil. And then, um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, uh, above the uh, sand is this flexible membrane. And then you cover it with regular soil. And then you cover it with a top soil that you can grow grasses on. And believe it or not, it's the grasses, all that vegetation that grows on top that holds everything in place. Now, the engineering comes from not you, you there are uh, standards that you cannot uh, build above we usually say you have to have a, a three to one slope in terms of um, the steepness that it can be and so we the the uh, landfills have to be designed so that they don't exceed that and so my work at DEP is checking those things are the are the uh, landfill slopes correct because if you can imagine, and you're, a, you're the landfill owner, sorry, um, 
If you can make this four to one instead of three to one, you can fit more waste in there. And you're gonna charge people for every ton that they bring in. So one of the things that uh, MassDEP does is we issue permits saying you can only do it like this and then we have to go check and we have to make sure that, um, that people that, uh, don't take advantage of their situation by uh, skirting outside the, re the uh, permit and building it in such a way that would be unsafe or uh, cause some type of uh, environmental harm. This is one that I've been working on, and um, <clears throat> this is, uh, I heard one of you guys mentioning it. it is the, this is the uh, Greenwood Street landfill, which is in the south part of town. And this landfill uh, was closed a number of years ago, but when the Big Dig project was going on, they needed a place to put the soils from the Big Dig. And so Worcester said, you can bring them here and we're gonna charge you, you know, $5 a ton. So it was a good money maker. But those soils were somewhat contaminated. Sometimes in our business we call it uh, downtown brown because it's not really the kind of soil that you would wanna grow vegetables in, but it wasn't soil that was grossly contaminated. So it was mildly contaminated. So they brought in uh, a million cubic yards. That's a lot, you know, how a, a typical, one of those long uh, dump trucks that you see, the, the um, uh, not a 10 wheelers, the, they're 30 yard containers on the back of the backs of those trucks. And so if you divide a million by 30 yards, it's a lot of truckloads. 300,000, no, 30,000 truckloads. And so, um, so the, that big dig soil was brought in and so this is the process of closing it. So here's the, the FML, flexible membrane liner. And then over here, they're, they're starting to put, starting to put uh, uh, soil on the top. The reason why I'm showing you this is because last summer, this slid. It's not supposed to look like this. It's supposed to, it's supposed to look like that. And so this may not, you may say, well, we're getting far afield from STEM, but this is what STEM looks like because, it, at least in the geosciences, you can be that one and zero kind of person, be a computer scientist, and, and that's, uh, there are many kinds of STEM fields. But um, one of the things that, uh, at least my area of STEM is, to deal with problems like this. Why did this failure happen? We, we need to go back out and check the slopes. That's one reason. It turns out that the, the uh, uh, main reason why this, all this uh, liner slid down the slope was because of the, they didn't properly run the heavy equipment um, up and down. And there were actually, I, I believe, two pieces, uh, I think it was a bulldozer and an excavator on the flexible membrane liner at the same time when it slid. So it wasn't so much um, a design failure, it was more of an operational failure. I have another picture of it here too. You can see there's the, all the creases there. So another aspect of, of STEM is managing the outcomes, managing the failures in some cases. Because you can imagine there was a lot of finger pointing that went on. There was uh, a number of the, you know, the contractor who was closing it didn't want to take responsibility. The, so they, they cut out sections of the FML to send to a lab to make sure that the, the liner had the, the appropriate roughness. There's a, a measurement and, and they are supposed to report what that roughness is. And so all of, the, so like everything, I, I guess that's sort of the theme of this talk is that this is all STEM. It's the guys in the lab measuring the roughness of the, of the plastic liner. The, this stuff is not cheap. I mean, it comes in these you know, big 30 foot long rolls and if there's a, a problem in it, it's a, a bunch of wasted material. 
not to mention the wasted uh, time and the cost of rebuilding it to bring it back. So there's the engineering design, there's the review part of it that, that I'm on, and, um, and then, oh, and then we'll get to the next thing. This thing, this, the grasshopper sparrow. Have, you, have any of you ever heard of a grasshopper sparrow? No, well I didn't either before this. So, now you know that the grasshopper sparrow is a Massachusetts bird that is not um, an endangered species, but it's a threatened species. And these birds really like landfills. They, they think landfills are great because they're, they're open, they have all this sun exposure on the top. And so land, these closed landfills our prime habitat for the grasshopper sparrow. Now, it's kind of funny, but it's actually kind of a good thing. Does it mean that in everything that we do, everything we build, everything we make, do we just wreck it? Or is it possible that when we're finished with the landfill, maybe some animal can use it as habitat? That's kind of a success in a way. Unfortunately, it makes all of our lives really difficult because these birds are very high maintenance. They don't want regular grasses. They want something called warm summer grasses. And warm summer grasses only grow when, in places where there's lots of sun exposure and uh, there's, there's very low organics in the soil. So normally, uh, organics in the soil, that's just like all the decomposing leaves and any, any decomposing plant matter that's in the soil. It's not counting the sand and the silt and the rocks. That's the inorganic matter. So the warm season, warm summer grasses grow in low organic soils, kind of like stuff you would see at the beach. You know how you, when, you, when you go in the dunes, you see like a tuft of grass growing here and a tuft growing there? Well, so now we're having to close these landfills with this, the top of the landfill has to have th these low organic soils and the specific kind of seed that will grow these, the, just the little bit of um, vegetation here and there. And that is also a challenge because like I said earlier, it's the grass that holds everything together. Fortunately, the birds like the top, and the top has almost no slope to it. It has just a tiny bit of slope. And so we're able to put the regular grasses that are able to really do a good job holding everything in place on the side slopes. And so, um, so far, we've been able to um, make everybody happy. We've been able to uh, create habitat for the sparrow, and, we've been able, and the engineers, like I said, I'm a geologist, not an engineer. The um, engineers are satisfied with the integrity of the, uh, of the closure. This, this picture, um, this came from Google Earth, and it, somehow the color got washed out. This is another project that I'm working on. Right here is the Clinton landfill. It's another old landfill that was closed some time ago. But the problem is, the, uh, 30 years ago, they didn't have flexible membrane liners, FMLs, we'll just say FMLs. What they would do to close it, oh, well, um, I should back up a little bit. Obviously, if you are done with the landfill, you can't just let the waste hang out and be exposed. The reason why is because when uh, water percolates through snow melt, rainwater, it will go through the waste. Uh, some landfills have a clay liner, liner on the bottom, but a lot of them don't. And it creates a, another kind of leachate, which will then get into wa water bodies. So when you close it, you want to try to hermetically seal it. You want to put that FML over the top. But 30 years ago, all they would do is they would use um, a clay type material. Well, Massachusetts is not really known for clay. We don't have, there's, you know, there's the Boston blue clay, and that's pretty good, but um, the material that was used in 
some of these landfill closures was pretty poor material for keeping water out of the landfills. So what has happened at this landfill is that water has um, gotten through the cap, gone through the waste, created a leachate, and then, you know, water always flows downhill, right? So it goes this way towards this uh, South Meadow Pond. And if you can see right in here, it's discolored. So even from an air photo, you can see the contamination in the pond. I actually have a better picture of this. Um, there's, this is a, a newer landfill. This is uh, the uh, MWRA landfill, and this one is not causing a problem because it's, uh, it's newer and it's well sealed. But in any case, so the, the leachate is flowing right under this landfill and coming up in this little cove of South Meadow Pond. This is a, a little better picture. So you can see it. it I, I mean, it's, it's amazing, isn't it, when you can actually see from the air contamination in a water body. So here it is coming right out. It's, it's starting along the shoreline here and sort of making its way out into the cove. There's the orange color there, the orange color there, there, there. You can even find some over here because the, the um, I'll just use this. So like if this is the landfill, the groundwater tends to go down and then come up. So uh, it can go underneath this landfill and sort of come up into the, uh, the pond. So what are we doing about this? We're going to recap it. And so the situation is that if you go to a town and you say, hey, you've got to spend $8 million doing this again, that it doesn't go over very well. Fortunately, uh, well, what we have allowed is the towns to do some uh, revenue generation by accepting soils. So like if, let's say you're a, um, the, uh, a real estate owner and you want to build uh, a shopping plaza most likely there's going to be some excavation that you'll have to do and you'll need to get rid of a bunch of soil and so you'll need a place to take that soil and these guys will take it and they'll charge you a pretty cheap rate um, and so that when they take in soils from development projects that funds their closure so I didn't go to school for this, you know? So this is, I guess, part of what I'm telling you is that you have to pick up these other aspects of the job. It's very multidisciplinary. You, you go to school for this, but then you have to be willing to learn the computer science, the, the um, political budgeting process. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm not a, I was not trained in law, but, but I'm writing legal documents to, uh, to allow some of these projects to go forward. Okay, so those are some of the things that I'm directly involved with. I used to work in hazardous waste remediation and that was sort of fixing a legacy pro uh, problem where there were lots of old businesses, old industries that, uh, that did the, their manufacturing processes from 40, 50, 80 years ago, like even further back, like the tanning industry, going back over 100 years, they would always locate a tannery alongside a river. And, and so uh, one of the things that was done to tan hides was to use um, a, a chromium compound. So a lot of that chrome ended up in, in the rivers. Sometimes they would dam the rivers so they would make a, a pond. So hazardous waste remediation is clean up of, for the most part, old hazardous waste problems. Every once in a while, there will be a tanker truck that you know, tips over on the turnpike, or there will be some new problem that's caused. And uh, so we have regulations now that require people to hire an environmental contractor right away to uh, clean those up. Um, 
One of the main issues for hazardous waste remediation is uh, vapor intrusion. So a lot of times there will be problems where solvents that were released as part of manufacturing, um, uh, manufacturing processes get into what's called the vados zone. So uh, like right under our feet in the ground is, um, is soil, but there's a lot of um, air space in there and vapor can get into that, uh, like if you release some solvent, let's say gasoline. The gasoline can um, uh, vaporize and travel through that, um, that pore space in the soil and it can make its way into buildings. And I actually have had to um, go to a medical center where people were getting headaches. And it turns out that they, and this is Worcester actually, um, they, the people inside were really getting headaches from gasoline uh, migrating about 150 feet from the gas station that was next door. So we, we have instruments that can detect it and, um, and, and so then it's an engineering problem to figure out how to prevent the impacts. Can you tell us what part of Worcester that was in? Uh, that was in the Gold Star Boulevard area. Okay. But that was years ago. So uh, I think... Well, well, and that would make sense with all those car dealerships. Right, exactly, yeah. Uh, okay, um, industrial wastewater, we'll talk about that in a minute. Emerging contamin contaminants, I have a slide to show about that. Emerging contaminants are just things that haven't been a problem before this. People are actually talking about nanoparticles and nanoproducts as being an inhalation hazard. Um, the waste industry, like, the, like waste management, Casella, these companies, they're concerned about whether they're going to have to treat this stuff differently. So, um, uh, oh, uh, another emerging contaminant is a, is a compound called perchlorate. Perchlorate is used in fireworks. So we, you know, we shoot off fireworks, and believe it or not, that stuff ends up in um, surface water bodies, and, and it actually is harmful to humans. Yeah? What about um, like nanoparticles of plastic? And that was what I was alluding to about the inhalation. I've heard people say that, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I've heard people say that that's one of the, um, main concerns is that they're so easy to get airborne that it's easy for them to get deep in the lungs. Well, I know it's a big concern in the ocean. So, uh, there's a visual artist. I saw some work that she did a couple of years ago um, in the Pacific and other places where these are huge um, vortexes of plastic have, you know, because the currents have pushed them together. Oh, right, right, right. But, but besides the really big pieces, there are all these little small particulates now that are in the, uh, in the water that there's no way to get them. Yeah, and, and some of, there are some natural cleansing processes, but it's um, uh, maybe imperfect. And then, I don't know if some of you may be interested in GIS, but uh, we actually have two GIS people at our office, Geographic Information Systems, and uh, we rely on them heavily. So if that's a STEM field that you might be interested in, it, it's, it's strong and getting stronger because um, it, it, there are all different ways to, to map. Um, it's, it's just pretty much a way to see what your situation is that you're dealing with and, um, and try to rectify it. Okay, so I just wanted to touch on hazardous waste. It all starts with a source. Uh, a lot of times, I actually was going to include a, a, this old black and white photo of uh, Love Canal. Some of you may remember Love Canal was um, outside of Buffalo, New York, where a bunch of drums containing waste chemical products were buried, and uh, people in that nearby region, well, local area, were affected. Um, their health was affected by uh, the, um, the airborne aspects of it and uh, drinking water from wells and, reservoir and re reservoirs and so forth. Uh, so we have really good regulations now to 
try to prevent future problems. The EPA has something that is called, it's, it's typically just called cradle to grave, where you have to track the chemical material from its production through its use to the disposal. And so if you can, if each one of the people who are using or creating or disposing of that chemical um, follow the reporting requirements and the, and the handling of the material, then hopefully we won't have more love canals because um, it's tracked. So, so that is one of the aspects of what we're doing now. Um, but like I said, we're dealing with some legacy issues where uh, things were handled differently uh, some time ago. So this brings back memories to me because I worked as a field geologist on the back end of a drill rig like this. And um, so I'm the, I'm the project geologist. I have to, uh, um, this, this is called a hollow stem auger. It augers down and then they have um, a pipe that goes down through the center of the hollow auger and they pound it down with this 140 pound uh, uh, hammer <clears throat> automated hammer. It collects a soil sample, they haul it back up, and then I have to look at the soil to determine uh, what the soil is comprised of. I can do some uh, instrument measures with instruments to determine whether there are any vapors in there. And so, uh, so that's the role of a geologist in, in this. Uh, one of the drillers I worked with said, uh, when I was complaining about the crummy weather that we had to work in, the, the driller said, there's only one kind of weather that we don't work in, and that's lightning. And every, because they've got a 35-foot boom that goes up in the air, and, um, and so they'll work in sleet and snow, and I'll tell you, there is nothing at all fun about standing in 35-degree rain for eight hours. It just is, it, it, it's, uh, it's a long way from those days in the White Mountains that got me into this field. So um, you can see in this picture, all of these people are in um, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. They've got the little duck boots on. Um, these guys here have respirators on. They're actually connected with a, um, a hose to uh, uh, an oxygen container here. I don't know why it's yellow, but um, so it's supplying air to them while they do this work. <clears throat> Most times, this is not this kind of protection is not needed because um, the the contaminants that you're looking for are not something that you have to worry about in terms of inhalation. But uh, this is. This doesn't look like STEM, but this is one of those aspects where if you're, go, if you're involved in the geosciences, you're, you're outdoors, you're collecting data, you may be collecting uh, samples uh, f related to the acid mine drainage that I was mentioning before. And so, you, uh, so it, it's not sitting behind a terminal, sitting behind a keyboard, just doing the analysis in the office. A lot of times it's going out collecting new data. And so that's what's done here. And then the other thing that I would do as a, a field geologist is uh, create sample jars of the material that was being brought up from the drill. And then I would have to pack it up in a cooler, bring it down to uh, freezing temperatures, and then send it off to the lab. So there are more people in the STEM field uh, doing the laboratory analysis of that to give me the numbers that I need to determine whether it's uh, either below the threshold of uh, re requirements or above the thresholds where uh, some remediation is necessary. Okay, so I mentioned we were gonna talk about industrial wastewater. Sometimes when you see a picture like this, you say, oh my God, we have such terrible environmental problems. I wanted to put very clearly that this is an old slide. So this is a, um, 
uh, some very obvious contamination from a paper mill 40 years ago, almost 50 years ago. And you can see that this is not a condition that, that we want to uh, persist. And some, some of us here will remember there's an old story of the Cuyahoga River in, um, in Ohio actually catching fire because there were floating um, uh, gasoline or solvents on, uh, solvents are ten technically, uh, typically lighter than or less dense than water, so they would float. Somehow they caught on fire. That, I mean, that's a condition that you can't allow to persist. There used to be a, used to be a pond down by Worcester Press Steel that would get lit on fire. Really? I didn't hear that. Uh, the so National you know, River back in Pittsburgh used to be all polluted and making green paper, the river would be green, orange, but I understand they clean it up now. You can go actual swimming, supposedly. But and the smell from the paper mills. I used to live oh. in Springfield, Oregon. Before I knew what a paper mill was, I got a ride hitchhiking in Washington with a guy, and his skin and the smell, uh, I thought he had some kind of disease. I didn't wow. realize he worked in a paper mill. So wow. Yeah, and, and so there have been, it, it's a lot cheaper to produce paper when you're doing it like this. And so it's, it adds cost to the industries to have to um, treat their industrial wastewater before it gets discharged. Uh, but we have, that's not my program, but um, we have people in our office that deal just with wastewater discharge and the standards that they're, if there are federal standards, we make, their, we make sure that they're following the federal standards, but we're really um, looking at the, the um, uh, state standards and they're usually pretty close. The reason why I mention this is that there, uh, uh, something that was used a long, long time ago was carbon paper. So, you know, if you, if you wanted to get a receipt for something, the person would write on the, on the receipt and then they'd have a copy and you'd have a copy. And then there was this really good invention called carbonless copy paper. So you didn't have to have a sheet of carbon paper between your two sheets of paper. The one paper was treated, and if you wrote on it, um, th there would be a transfer of the whatever you wrote to the paper underneath. The, the reason why I mention that is that the uh, treatment that was done to the paper was um, involved polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs. So one of the things that we're dealing with as a result of uh, paper production is uh, riverways like this that have PCBs in the sediments that are, you know, because you can imagine as this river flows, after a while, all of that uh, material that's in the water is eventually going to settle out, and it's going to stay in that sediment. And one of the things I feel most horrible about is that I, I, I was on some uh, Boy Scout trip with my son's troop, and, and we were canoeing in the Housatonic River. And at one point, there was this uh, rope swing. So all the kids were having a great time swinging into the water. And I have this picture of, of my son like spewing water out of his mouth because he just went underwater. And I found out later, there's quite a bit of P PCBs in the Housatonic. So I felt really uh, bad about that. But you know, he's walking and talking, and so <laughs> hopefully he's OK. But, but the point is, is that we need to, um, this is another legacy issue that we need to um, address. And in the Housatonic, the, the um, company that was operating the plant upstream was General Electric. And so they have been in negotiations for years with the federal government, with the local residents. They also did things like um, they, and this was not uh, um, this was not any, in any way malicious, but back in the day, they would um, tell nearby residents that if they wanted to come get uh, soil material, they could come pick it up there. So a lot of residents spread out material that was from the plant on, on their lawns. And so there are impacts to actual residential properties. So, the, so again, this is, it's STEM, but it's also politics, it's also who's going to pay for it, does the company, is the company even in business? A lot of companies aren't in business, then who pays? 
So uh, this is getting back to that multidisciplinary uh, aspect. Uh, I was talking about uh, emerging contaminants. And this is one of them, 1,4-dioxane. And it's, uh, I wrote there, it's, it's a solvent. It's also a stabilizer for other solvents. And it's also used in cosmetics. If you Google uh, dioxane and uh, do a, a, a Google image search, you see a whole bunch of pictures of uh, baby shampoo. I didn't even really want to go there. Because I don't, I don't know if it's in baby shampoo, but I, did, I do know that it's in cosmetics. Um, so we find this. I, I'm working on a, um, a landfill in Westboro, and, and uh, actually a couple of landfills, where this is one of the contaminants that 10 years ago nobody ever had any concern about. And um, one of the things that is important about this is how small a quantity is considered to be environmentally or harm, environmentally harmful or a risk to human health. And so it's 0.3 parts per billion or 000 grams per liter. It's a really small quantity. And so one of the things that we deal with at the department is the um, the typical laboratory analyses are not able to get down to this number. They're able to get down to this number, like three, 30 or three grams per liter, but not the point, not the point three. And so they have to do a more expensive test just to find out if it's there. So there's a lot of grumbling about that because I, if I'm not mistaken, it's, it's something like $500 per sample. And so we try to be reasonable about it. We try to say, collect data from your sampling points. And if you spend the money of, well, they have to do these more sensitive tests, but if you can collect a body of data using these more expensive tests to prove that it's not there, then come back to us with a proposal to use the less expensive test, if you've documented that it's not there. So, um, so this is an emerging contaminant. I mentioned perchlorate's another one. This is not an emerging contaminant. This is another one of these hazardous waste things. Um, <clears throat> So tetrachloroethylene, or perchloroethylene, or per perchloroethene, but everybody just calls it perch. So um, does anybody know the most common use for perch? You've all had it used for you, I bet, because this is, there are new technologies now, but this is the solvent used in dry cleaning. So they have, they have special machines, and that's why it's called dry cleaning, because they don't use water. They use this solvent. So all the clothes go in, tumbles around. The, the perchloroethylene takes out the stains, take out the, uh, um, any of the dirt. And then they spin the clothes, and they use a, a dryer to get rid of the solvent. And in the old days, after the solvent was used a bunch of times and, had, and was, was pretty dirty, they had, the dry cleaner would have something out back called a dry well. And they would just pour the spent solvent down into a dry well, which is pretty much a hole. And so that's, so that's what you see here. Um, they call it surface discharge. It would go through, this is the Vados zone that I was talking about, where there's, see, uh, oh, well, let's see. Uh, they don't really show a close up here, but they're showing like little particle, little particle, little particle, and there's space in between them. And here's the groundwater table. Down below this, all that space is filled up with water. Up above it, there's uh, air in the space. Here they've got the little bit of PCE in, to show what it's like. So this, uh, the PCE can mi migrate as a vapor and get into other, other buildings. Doesn't have to be a house, it can be any uh, occupied building. 
Um, I was mentioning that solvents are less dense than water, but not this one. This one is more dense than water, so it tends, it's called a sinker. So it goes down and down and down and down until it can't go down anymore. So we call this uh, DNAPL, which stands for dense non-aqueous phase liquid. And so there are problem, there, there are sites where they have a problem of this uh, DNAPL, the PERC, migrating either as a separate phase liquid, see it's, they show it in red, or it's mixing with water and migrating with the, the groundwater. So this is an, um, another aspect of STEM that I, I used to be involved with a lot more. Um, and you know, it's actually kind of fun because sometimes it's sort of like a mystery. You have to solve the mystery. Where is it coming from? We've got, we found it here. Which direction is the groundwater flowing? So if, you're, if you like mysteries, then this is a good field to be in because there's always a mystery of like, what is causing the leachate to be formed? Where is the PCE coming from? So that's one of the things that I'm attracted to is that it, it's uh, kind, of, kind of fun, sort of like science mysteries. So that's that. And is it with radon, which is naturally produced, is that one of your concerns? Or do you let nature? It's it's not my concern, but it is um, it is a, a problem in Massachusetts generally because it is um, it is a daughter product of uranium, if I'm not mistaken. So when the uranium undergoes some radioactive decay, it turns, it releases uh, radon. And so the radon at room temperature or those temperatures is a gas. So it goes up. And so it will go, and because it's a gas, it can easily get into buildings. Solids, right? What? Solids. Cellars, yeah. right. So, so for radon, the typical fix is to vent, just, just vent the basement. And then hopefully your living space above is, is okay. So we don't do that, we don't, um, I think we try to provide information on radon, but uh, there's not really anything that anybody can do or it's not like we can regulate it. Well, that's what we do, we're a regulatory agency. So there's nothing we can do to make radon stop being, stop entering the people's homes. Um, <clears throat> uh, so this is an example of another, this is kind of a GIS thing like I was talking about before. This is one of the things that I would do at, when I was investigating hazardous waste releases where you, you take, you um, get your drill rig out there and you put in a bunch of borings and then you collect uh, soil samples, you measure vapor that's in the soil samples, and then you, you, know, you get something that is kind of like a bullseye. So low zero concentration up to, what is it? Uh, it looks like parts per million, 1,200 parts per million. So, so you, you map out your data, and then you figure out where the source is. And so then, of course, well, it's great that you know where the source is, but, um, but then what do you do about it? So is it, um, and then that's where the engineers come in. If any of you have any interest in engineering, um, there is something called uh, soil vapor extraction, where you can, you basically put a big vacuum pump on the ground and you, um, you, you run it continuously 24 hours a day for a few years, and then you run it through some, uh, activated carbon and the, the solvent will adhere to the carbon and get out of the ground and if you can get it out of the ground then you can prevent it from um, uh, hopefully reduce the impact to the groundwater and also um, reduce the impact to the buildings that you have nearby. So uh, then I just want to talk a little bit about um, GIS. This is something that I grabbed from uh, you can see that oh shoot um, you can see from, this is our, our uh, website, there's this uh, program that we have called Oliver. I think anybody can use it, you just have to set up an account. It's all publicly available uh, data. 
And so, um, so it's kind of fun to mess around with, but it's also a tool. So for instance, the green here, I, I just uh, clicked on the layer for um, high yield aquifers. So this is where the aquifer is in Worcester, or one, one of them. Um, it did, really doesn't show up very well, but here's my Greenwood Street landfill right there. This right there is some perk uh, discovery that we made. We're not sure if it's related to the landfill or not. We're not quite sure where it's coming from right now. Um, and so that's a hazardous waste site right here. And so you can use this tool to figure out what do I have to be worried about? I've got, I've got some contamination that I need to um, address. What is the opposite of the contamination? It's what we call receptors. So the receptor here would be the, the aquifer. Now, this aquifer is not used by Worcester, but if I'm not mistaken, Millbury down here does. So, um, so, you, so you want to be aware of what things are out there so that you can figure out how to target your investigation and, and target your approach to, to remediate it or prevent impacts. So I just, you know, it's, it's great if you want to be a field geologist and do all that uh, data collection on the, the back of a drill rig, it's, it's interesting and educational. But some people might be more interested in GIS. And so there are a million different ways to uh, study um, STEM in the GIS thing. So uh, geoscience, um, has anybody ever heard of Chigurid? You would know if you, because none of you have ever had chiggers, and I have. So chiggers are these little boring insects that I, I was deploying uh, um, some seismic instruments in a cornfield in Illinois because there had been an earthquake. So they sent a bunch of us graduate students to set out the seismic instruments to try to find if there were any aftershocks. And a day later, I'm like scratching my legs. Chiggers are awful. So you get this stuff called chiggerid, and it, it, um, it keeps the insects, well, it's, I won't go into it, but it kills the uh, chiggers. Um, <clears throat> so, you've, so I'm trying to like span the range here. You know, there's the like sitting behind the keyboard stuff, and then there's the go out and get data. Uh, shovel, well, Oh, okay, so this is what my training was in in, in uh, grad school, earthquake seismology. There's a shovel there. So I went to the University of Memphis, and the reason why there's an earthquake center there is because back in 1811 and 1812, there were three of the largest earthquakes that have hit North America. They were somewhere between 8.6 and 9 on the Richter scale. Now, there were no seismic instruments back in 1811, so they don't know exactly the strength, but, um, but these earthquake seismologists are pretty smart. Yeah? I read that, they, that the land rolled like waves. I read accounts of it that they had, but only verbal accounts. Well, see, that's the thing. There's this thing called the modified Mercalli scale, and so they can go back and look at um, newspapers from this time, and people reported these things, they, they reported um, uh, submerged logs shooting up out of the Mississippi River. This is a documented fact. It rang church bells in Boston. So you can look at the kinds of impacts that people report, and then you can look at an earthquake that happens yesterday and see what kind of impacts people report. They can say, oh, I was 50 miles away and it, you know, it broke my window. So then you can make a pretty good guess at what the earthquake magnitude was back in 1811 by looking at what people say then compared to now. Well, there's this other technique, technique that is kind of interesting. Down in the area of Tennessee and Arkansas where I studied, uh, there are all these um, layers of sediment. Layer, a layer of sand, then a layer of clay, then a layer of topsoil, and it kind of goes like a, like a tiramisu cake, you know? And so, have you ever made coffee where you, 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 you pour the water into the grounds and then the, the water runs through, 
And if you shake the filter a little bit, it, it becomes more liquid again and more water gets out of the grounds. Well, that's what's going on here. When the ground, uh, the, um, uh, what has happened and what has been found down in, in especially Arkansas, where I studied him, um, the sand layer is, is um, saturated with water. And when the ground shook from the earthquakes, it caused what is called liquefaction. And so it turned into that situation like when you shake the coffee filter. And now all of the weight of the layers above are, instead of pressing down on sand, they're now pressing down on water, this liquefied material. And it causes this thing called a sand blow, where this one is actually from below. Yeah, so um, this is an earlier one, 900. This is from 1811. So what happens is the hydraulic pressure causes the water with the sand to blow up through the, this A horizon. And, and uh, then it deposits all that sand. It's like a fountain of sand um, on, the, on the land. Well, there are uh, paleo seismologists, like pa paleo paleontology is a study of, of dinosaurs and such. So paleo means old. So paleo earthquakes is trying to figure out uh, when earthquakes happened a long time ago. Why do we care? Why do we care? Well, it's because earthquakes follow a pattern. And they usually have what's called a recurrence rate. So they may not happen every 75 years, or you know, like AD 900 to 1811, but they usually follow some, with, with some uh, repeatability. It may be from like 500 to 800 years. Or uh, I, I think the uh, San Andreas is typically about 75 years between major earthquakes. Last major one was 1911, and I think, I don't know if I would recommend buying uh, real estate in San Francisco, but uh, I think we're overdue. We're also overdue for another um, New Madrid seismic zone. New Madrid, uh, Missouri is where these earthquakes were centered. So. This is another, it's another thing. I just want to, I, I keep, keep sort of harping on it, the, the STEM aspects of this. <clears throat> this is STEM. The analysis of the data is STEM. Okay, and then this is, this is more my hobby. It's not anything related to my, my uh, um, I just, I'm interested in space. So I, if you're not interested by any of the stuff that I just talked about, there's, uh, a million things that you can do in the real high-tech, out-of-this-world space stuff. This is Buzz Aldrin deploying a field instrument on the moon. Can you guess what the first instrument was that NASA wanted to put on the moon? Seismometer. Seismometer. So they put a bunch of seismometers on the moon because they wanted to find out if there were moonquakes. It turns out there really are moonquakes. Deep moonquakes caused by tides, like you know the, the, um, the Earth and the moon going around each other. It basically causes the moon to sort of go like this. And so it um, squeezes and pulls, and, and the tidal moonquakes. Uh, vibrations from meteorites, uh, thermal quakes caused by the expa expansion of the crust uh, from the sun. And then uh, shallow moon quakes, not quite sure why. So that's a cool thing. Oh, that was that. Uh, so that's, that, those are the end of my slides. But I just wanted to say that if, um, if you're interested, I guess the, the main thing about STEM is curiosity. There, if you want to pursue this field, there are people that are the, the number one quality is curiosity. And the, the cool thing about it is that people will do the craziest stuff. So f I don't know if you follow the kinds of things that NASA has done. But for example, they, the engineers at NASA wanted to collect um, uh, comet dust. So they came up with this like totally harebrained plan. I cannot believe anybody agreed to fund it. So the idea was we're going to launch this probe, and we're going to 
send it around a couple of planets to slingshot it so that it, as, the, as the comet flies by, just after the comet flies by, this probe is going to go right through crosswise through the tail of the comet. And right before it gets to the comet tail, a door is going to open up and there's going to be this material called aerogel inside. And as it flies through the tail, the, co the comet dust is going to get stuck in the aerogel. And then the door is going to close. And then the, the probe is going to, it's on some trajectory, and it's going to come back, and we're going to get it back on Earth. But just to make it more difficult, just to make it more of a challenge, if that's not enough of a challenge, rather than just have this thing come back and land on Earth, they, the real concern was, OK, well, if it lands in the Mojave Desert, and it's covered with dust, and we have to like, pick this thing up out of the desert, well, you know, we're going to have to be super careful to make sure that we're not getting any Earth dust in with the comet dust. So they hatched a different plan. And the different plan was, as this thing comes back through the atmosphere, we'll deploy parachutes. And then we're going to fly over with a helicopter and snatch it in midair before it hits the ground. Snatch it and then pull it in. and and then we'll take it to the lab, I think it was in Washington, um, and then we'll take it all apart in a clean room, and then we get to explore the aerogel and see what it is. Parachute didn't deploy. Oh. <laughs> so it did smash. It smashed like crazy. I mean, it had no, nothing to break it, but, you know, to slow it down. So it smashed, and so a lot of people looked pretty bad because it didn't work as they planned. They collected it, but the thing held together. So they did the decontamination, and they were able to extract information from, of what was contained in the dust. So, so if I wasn't doing this field, I would probably like to be driving the Mars rover or something like that because th there's, there's so many cool things that you can do. It's just a question of finding what your curiosity is. And uh, there's a, a guarantee that you will find something that really uh, ignites your passion. So that's what I came to talk about. Thank you very much for your attention.